Welcome to the Extra Podcast. This is episode number 235. My name's Greg. I will be a part of the podcast today. Joining me around our square table, as always, is uh, our silent producer, Matt. He just waved. We also have Pastor Jeff. Hey, how's it going? I'm well. Are you? How are you? Good. Good. Pastor Andy's here. Merry Christmas. And also with you. And Pastor Crystal. Is it too soon? Sorry. To say Merry Christmas? Yeah. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> You're no, very... it's not. What are we, what's the date today? What, the recording date of our... December 15th. Yeah, so we are well and truly near Christmas. Crystal, you didn't get to say hi hardly. Hello. There you go. So coming up this weekend, big, big news is uh, Star Wars. <laughs> That's. It. I thought you were going to say church. No, <laughs> but no, that's not the big thing that's happening this weekend. No, big right? new, the big news. Oh, the big news, yeah, uh, is going to be the Star Wars movie. It is coming out. Yeah, yeah. So you guys gonna go? Nope. Or, of course. I don't know if I'll go this week. I mean, I, I'm, I like I, I've told you in our pre-production meeting, which lasted, uh, <laughs> which is very formal. Seconds, yeah. That I'm going to be attending the Star Wars on Monday. Mm-hmm. I will be finding a theater that has. Uh, you know, all the theaters seem to have about 15 showings a day of this of this film mm. in in several different theaters. Are you so, kidding me? So I am going to be going on Monday, I think. Wow! Early you have in the to day. Buy your tickets early, though. My sons are trying to go in Vancouver, and it was all sold out in all the theaters for over what, the weekend. For the whole weekend. Yeah. yeah. So That's... they ended up coming back here to. They're going to watch. They have tickets already for Sunday afternoon. That okay. was incredible. Yep. Exciting! Exciting that they're going to end up going. I'm, I am actually. I'm a bit of a. I'm a bit of a, a Star Wars guy. It was the first movie I ever saw in my life. Was wow. in the at, a, at a theater was uh, Star Wars. That's yeah. a good question to wow. ask around the table. What's the first mm-hmm. movie you've ever seen in your life? Oh, 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 um, Star Wars at a theater. Okay. <laughs> at a theater, just Te- was Star Wars. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. How okay. old are you? Are you like seventeen? <laughs> Come on, man. I didn't get out very much. All right. Yeah. By the way, I am planning on going to see Star Wars. I do look forward to it, but there's no way I'm trying to go weekend that it opens. I'm not that guy. Okay, so in turn... Wait a minute. Crystal gets oh, to tell her yeah, first movie. Yeah. I think mine might have been Star Wars, too. Although Crystal, with, you and I are the same age, though, aren't we? You're a little bit younger than I am. Uh-huh. Oh. Well. How old are um, you, Jeff? When did E.T. come out? Because I remember seeing that one, too. That was after, right? Yeah. After E.T. Star Wars? was in, uh, what, 82 or something okay, like so that. So Star Wars was, what, 77? 70, some, 77, 78, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, might have been my Some Star time. Wars guys out there, in 77. <laughs> what are you, how do you not know that? How do you not know that? That's like Greg looked a little like that there. Uh, in fact, Greg does an incredible Chewbacca. Yeah. Could we get just a sample sure. of that? You Wasn't the question, Greg, that, that you were going to ask us that we, we which, what character, because people do dress up to the Star yeah. Wars thing. Yeah, yeah. And, I don't. I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do if I go to the theater and there are people dressed up as Star Wars characters. There, our our intern, silent producer Matt, is going to go to the second show that is running on Thursday night, dressed up in a robe and bring a lightsaber. Nice. Sweet. Can we get some? Can we get some video or Obi-Wan. still shots of that? He, he's going to be dressed as Obi Wan. He's nice. dead. So here's what you have to is do. Your you wife going to join right? you? Oh, did I just ruin the whole series for you? You. He dies. You. <laughs> <laughs> you need to take a selfie, and then we need to make that as the We're picture gonna... for this episode or for an episode in the future of you dressed up as Obi Wan. We'll see if that happens. Mm. So, Greg, what would you be? You... I'd be I'd be Chewbacca because I'm a dead ringer. Are you, you now? Want, you want to hear it? Yeah, here it comes. <gasps> We're waiting. <laughs> No, Mertz. Right? Sounded like a seal. I'm sorry. Were you gonna do it now? It's Chewbacca. Do you want seal? me to go again? You missed oh, you, it. oh, you did you missed it. it. <laughs> Oh, I missed that. <laughs> okay, it still sounds like a dolphin. It sounds you, like a are dolphin. Are you okay, Greg? Dude, <laughs> I think Greg might need the Heimlich. <laughs> it sounds like a dolphin. It sounds like a smoking dolphin. <laughs> I actually just played a clip from the Cove. Oh, did you? Um, See, any, in, in Greg's oh. mind, it sounds perfect. Yeah, it does. But could of, we could we actually hear what the real? I'll get that going. Who who yeah, would you go as Crystal? The real Chewbacca. I think it'd have to be Princess Leia. I mean, uh, would yeah. you get the little bun cast. things on the side of your head there? 
Yeah, and you know, in the seventies when we did watch it, my mom actually wore her hair like that. For she a while. did not. She had it in braids. <laughs> that is <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> if I had hair, I would do that. Okay, Maybe. Andy, who's your who you? I would go for here. Is is it there, Greg? There Can we just go. get that one more time? Does okay, you do. This thing. is what Greg doesn't sound like. <laughs> I would dress up as a Wookie. I would think. you so the same thing as him, Chewbacca, but a different Wookie, like as part of the Wookie Nation? <laughs> like, yeah, Chewbacca's like, cousin. Yeah, no, you know the. But maybe I'm wrong here. The little guys, the little Wookies. The Andy, I don't think you have a single hair on your body right now. So this is. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd have silent to producer intern Matt just told me confirmed that it's actually called an Ewok. What? It uh, is not an Ewok. Is the little guy? That's what Andy's talking about. Well, what's a Wookie then? Uh, Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Chewbacca's a Wookie. Oh, Andy. All right. I I just. I, I added myself. You Andy, movie. you're ill-prepared for guy. this. He's not a real guy. Who would you be? Han Solo? Yeah, actually, yeah. Han Solo's my guy. He is. Can we rewind, rewind the uh, podcast and just delete that whole section no. there? No. <laughs> so, um, so an yeah. Ewok. I would be an Ewok. And you would be Han Solo. Huh? I would. Nice. I would. You know, Mark Hamill's apparently in this one. Luke Skywalker. Wow. He was the worst actor in the history of the world. <laughs> Why? He was no, what? he was terrible. Have you watched? You've watched the first ones. Yeah. Oh my goodness, he's bad. Mm-hmm. The worst scene of any acting ever done ever is when uh, when he is being uh, he's on the uh, on the uh, it's not a Death Star, but he's in, he's in uh, uh, one of the Imperial ships or whatever. We're and making so many people mad. Oh, I know. Some guys are like, you're going to appear on ship. <laughs> anyway, he's there, and Darth Vader finally reveals to him that I'm your Luke, I am your father. His response after the Luke, I am your father line, worst acting ever. <laughs> 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 You can't. I keep thinking. Really, that was the take you took. How many takes did you have to get for him? Eventually, to do George this? was like, "Let's just use it." <laughs> That's all we're it's getting. Terrible. Oh, it's terrible. Anyway, well, all you Star Wars geeks out there, get your emails ready. <laughs> just kidding. I love. I love a good Star Wars. I've already pressed send. Thing. <laughs> no, no um, I love it. It's awesome that there are Star Wars geeks in the world, and there it 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 is actually one of those things that would be kind of fun to get into. You'd have to put aside all of your dignity. <laughs> okay, oh, I you just have to go full bore into. It. Yeah. Crocker, Matt, yeah, Matt's sh- not Here, said. Oh yeah, there's here's no a dignity question. in it. So here's a question for you: yeah. what, what would you guess then, with all these Star Wars fans, is going to be the weekend oh. tally on ticket sales? Uh, this 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 film will break all records, all every single last record, mm-hmm. right? I have so no we'll idea see. what it's going to be. No, it's going to be huge. Yeah. What I, is it now? The record is the Hunger Games. I don't know. They I thought it was the passion. It was Titanic, Titanic for a long time. Titanic, man. But there's Are you no talking way. Single weekend record or like the oh, opening yeah, the, weekend? Yeah, there's a difference, isn't there? There's yeah. the opening weekend and, and then, then there's, there's a long just term. The, yeah, yeah, long term. The Titanic was huge in the first weekend, I think. <laughs> but anyway, this is this. Yeah, maybe this is Titanic. Maybe that's what it's about. Just things sinking. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for that, everybody. That was great. <laughs> Hey, here's a, our first question. Oh, the oh the first question. It's Christmas is coming, right? It's it's December fifteenth, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about what is your favorite um, Christmas commonly quoted Christmas error. You mean around the story, the, yeah. the biblical story, yeah, yeah. of Christmas? Yeah. What is the what is the error? Well, I I'll start. Uh, I the there is no innkeeper in the story, and yet the innkeeper is always a jerk. And he's always mean and nasty and telling them to get out of the out of the area. It just says that there was no room for them at the inn. But yeah. we create this innkeeper and he's yeah, he is. He's always like the worst example of a of a like a one star hotel owner. Get out of here. You, we have nothing here for you. Go in the back. So yeah, and then they go and find themselves in some sort of barn or a cave or yeah, something. Yeah, right. This would this plays into mine. Uh, there is no inn. Uh, well, there's no room for them at the inn. Right, but the word inn in the Greek, I mean, this could be guest house, you know, guest room. Um, like, most likely, I mean, 
even today in developing nations, there is no such thing as an inn. Like normally it's somebody's home that you open up and maybe you got a couple extra rooms and you'll rent those out and then you have to and then you'll provide food from it's not like there were restaurants and hotels back then. Mm. There's not even now in most developing nations. Weren't there caravan stops? So kind of like a RV park. Oh, I thought sure. there were. I thought that that's what. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I'm they, sure there were traveling. Oh yeah, they stuff. probably threw a tent down on the ground. But this idea of an of an inn is a very very modern idea. But what so most likely what you would have had is, uh, as I would see this is um, Joseph probably had family there and probably was went to stay in one of their guest rooms or something like that, and there wasn't room. That's how I would most likely understand it. And then um, to be like you know the no room for them and this idea of. Uh, you know, we see in uh, Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 7, that uh, placed them in a manger. I mean, in, a, in many of these homes, like they kept their animals actually in the, the basement suite, if you will. Uh, and, and people probably could have stayed there, and most likely they did. And there's different things you could talk about with regards to that, why. So you don't see it as a barn all by itself in the middle of nowhere. You see it as part of a living accommodation. Yeah. Like I mean, archaeologically, you don't see... Like, what you'll see is walls that were created for, like, pens where sheep might be or something like that. But most often, even today, people want to keep the, the animals in their houses. It's much easier to take care of them and protect them. Mm. Uh, theft... I mean, these the, the animals would have been your most valuable possession. Uh, and, and so you just don't leave those out outside. So yeah, that's so absolutely. You you just don't you don't see it today, and you don't see it archaeologically. Hmm. Crystal, for me, I'd say just the wise men appearing on the scene. Um, all the manger stories, all the Christmas productions have them coming right with the shepherds and everything else. Um, mm. I think we talked about that in one of the sermons. But yeah, there's yeah. always the the wise men show up with them. The exact time at the same time. Yeah, good stuff, eh? They're all there together, the wise men, the shepherds. It just makes it easier. Totally. Right? Yep. Killed many birds with one stone. Yeah. I'm just actually looking at the at the Greek that Andy was highlighting, and that the, the word that's used for in in uh, Luke 2 is also used in Mark 14 when Jesus is asking uh, where his guest room is where he could eat his Passover with his disciples. So this mm. is has in, in view a, a room, a, a, a kind of an upper room you know, eating area. Uh, yeah. In someone's house. And also Luke uses it again in Luke 22. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples, which is the same, uh, there's a parallel text to the Mark 14. And so there, that's the only three times that the word is used in the New Testament, is in Mark 14, talking about Jesus wanting to have this room to eat the Passover, in Luke 22, where it also speaks to that, and then you have Luke 2, there's no room for them at, in the inn. So there would be some good evidence for Andy's suggestion that this is just, this is a guest well, room. In that of, upper yeah. room idea. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Point cool. for Andy. Thank you guys. Appreciate that. Well, think, Andy, you've just, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you rocked my world, buddy. I don't, I don't even know what to do. I don't even want to think about Christmas in the same way. I don't I even want to say mine now. Yeah, well, yeah. what is yours, Greg? My, <clears throat> mine is probably just the, the seasonal aspect of it, of some people being really committed to talking about it as though it happened around this time, mm -mm. whereas the date's probably, it, it probably wasn't around. Well, the this shepherds time. wouldn't have been in the fields yeah. overnight. Uh, during the colder parts of the year, there. So we're talking spring and summer, right? Likely, and uh, and so in fact, most people place this time in the spring. Most of the scholars would put it in the springtime at some. So that what we're talking about, like a April May, sort of. But why is it on the tw December twenty fifth, though, Greg? I don't even know. It was just it's a good question, Andy. You must know this. Uh, I do. And I have to have to go back in my mind and remember there was a pope, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, that um, that put it on this day, I believe, on the twenty fifth. Is it a hijacking of a cultural holiday? That's well, we, we know that with the winter solstice. <clears throat> it is. Uh, well, y yes, the winter solstice happens right around then, but but also, 
and more directly, it would be Saturnalia, which is an ancient Roman festival in December, uh, which was a, a period of, I'm, I'm reading this online now, of general merrymaking, and it was the predecessor of Christmas. Uh, it was a it was a it was a Roman holiday that uh, everyone celebrated around this time when the when the empire started to get more and more Christian. The Christians saw what they celebrated in Saturnalia, and if you look anything about Greek history and and what what they were celebrating around then, the Christians thought, well, we'll just hijack this holiday because everyone everyone gets yep. you know everyone's celebrating already, and we'll make it into a Christian holiday. Which has led some people to say, oh, see, the origins of Christmas Day are pagan, which is absolutely true in terms of the day itself and the time of the year. But the Christian church is really good at hijacking holidays and other stuff. We do it all the time. We hijack, I mean, and and so, by the way, also is the Bible, this is what we call a polemic in the Bible, where you, uh, in order to make a point that your God is greater, you actually compare him to the deity that doesn't actually exist. This happens all over the place. You'll, you'll... Uh, so uh, the prophets of Baal and uh, Elijah on the top of the uh, Mount Carmel, this is all a polemic text where Elijah knows that Baal isn't real, but he's pretending that he is, and he's comparing the one true God to Baal in order to highlight that everything you're looking for in Baal actually is found in the one true God. So this, we, we steal these images and ideas from people all over the time, all the time, and there are several other times during the year that the Christian church has tried to pick stuff up. I do know that the Christmas tree, for example, I think uh, one of the history of it was that they used to bring it in t- as a celebration of preserving the preserving the life, you know, because you get during the, the winter evergreen. season, everything yep. dies, but here you have this evergreen tree that comes inside <laughs> of a building. And so you are, in, in essence, preserving the life of the world kind of thing through this tree that was brought inside your house. Well, that's totally pagan. But Christians, and I, I want to say St. Boniface, mm. I might be wrong about that, but uh, he ended up saying, well, it looks like the Trinity, right? Because you have three sides to it, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm. Uh, so we'll, we'll steal that, too, and turn it into, a, to, into something that's really great. By the way, I'm thinking Martin Luther was the first person to put lights the on lights the tree, on. wasn't that? The candles? Because mm. he's not, he doesn't obey fire code. <laughs> Johnny did a bo- blog post on this a year or two ago. It might still be on the website, but oh, yeah. because people were pushing back against the Christmas tree and against celebrating Christmas at Christmas, and yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know the the Puritans, uh, Oliver Cromwell and stuff. They like they stopped Christmas celebrations in England when they took over years ago because of the because they thought it was being ruined by. Uh, just like a lot of Christians today, they thought it was being ruined by everything else. It's about Jesus, and you're turning it into everything else, so we're not celebrating it. Take that. Yeah, Cromwell was funny. But it's an interesting question. Like, do we back away from cultural things, or do we kind of try and take it over and reinterpret and right. reinvent them? Right? Yeah, well, and the... as Christians, I think now we're starting to back away mm. rather than where I think in the past people just said, well, let's make them Christian. Right. That's one of the reasons I tell my kids that October 31st is Reformation, Reformation Day, and it is. And I think it's a great twist of providence that the Lord mm. has made it so that uh, we can celebrate the great truths of the Reformation on the day that everybody else is talking about, you know, ghosts and goblins. So, yeah, it's great. Hmm. Steal away. That's what I say. Steal <laughs> cultural stuff away and reinterpret it and attach Christian meaning to it. Right? Perfect. Isn't yoga like that? Ooh, where's Ezra? <laughs> He's on here. <laughs> Somewhere. Kidding, just kidding. I'm not saying that you should start Christian uh, yoga Ezra studios. has perked up somewhere. I was yeah. just going to say, somewhere Ezra's <laughs> like, someone <laughs> said yoga. Okay, <laughs> uh, here's our first uh, question from a listener. It's based off of uh, a family conversation that they were having, and it's all about asking if can Christians get tattoos. What are your opinions on Christians getting tattoos? Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll uh, start. I, I don't really have much of an opinion on Christians getting tattoos. I I think if they here, let me let me just say w- one thing about. Let me say a couple things about tattoos I find interesting. One is um, my wife and I one time were in Kalimantan, which is uh, in Borneo. Is this a story about how you got a tattoo with your wife? Because <laughs> no. I don't want to know it if that's <laughs> what it was. I haven't shown it to you yet. You don't want to okay. see it either. Does it uh, say Borneo to be wild? 
Sorry. No, it doesn't, Greg. <laughs> Did you just snort? No. That's I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> okay. At any rate, back to story time with Steiger. <laughs> We're in Borneo, and we meet these this uh, this this uh, guy in this village, tribal guy, and he's tattooed from top to bottom. Like that's what this tribe does. And he was talking to us about how upset he was with the with the young people because none of them want to get tattooed. <laughs> and I just thought, man, that's so ironic because <laughs> here we live in a culture that it's like that's the cool thing to do is to get tattooed. I, I, when, I when I went to Los Angeles to do my master's degree, I remember thinking, man, I'm thankful I don't have a tattoo. I'm the odd one out here. Like I've never seen so many tattoos in my life right. in, in Los Angeles. So one of the first things I just want to say is this idea that it's a very – cultural thing oh, right now. Doubt. It's like, yeah. it's the new cool. It's what it is, represents. Well, yeah. it also, like you said, in certain cultures around the world, to be tattoo, to, to have a tattoo is a sign, is a sign of commitment or things like that. And so, mm-hmm. and so it's actually looked upon favorably for a Christian to have a tattoo of a cross or something else. You know, I, I know places in the world where uh, there are tattoos that one would get in order to signal their, their commitment to their spouse. So, it's not as easy as saying, well, does God not like tattoos? Mm-hmm. It, well, I, the, perhaps the question is better stated, what are the cultural reasons that people get tattoos today? And are those cultural reasons uh, biblically defensible or biblically sustained, something like that? So one of the chief arguments against it is that someone will appeal to it being in the, the Pentateuch and the law f- to, for people of God to not get tattoos. So Crystal, do you have that? No, I've been looking for the verse, but I can't find it. We were at the MB conference this year in Winnipeg and Bruxy Cavey, who was one of the speakers, had this tattoo on his arm. And so we were all curious as to what it was because it was a Bible verse and we looked it up and it was the verse saying, don't get tattoos. tattoos. Yeah, <laughs> which was pretty funny. What Levi- is it? Leviticus. Okay, I thought it was 19 somewhere. 1928, silent producer Matt. And it says, do not Cut your bodies for the dead or, or put tattoos. tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Mm. Be interesting to look up with that, that word tattoo. So here words. you get uh, here you get into discussion about the uh, about the enduring significance of the Old Testament law, which is an interesting discussion to have. There are several different viewpoints regarding how we ought to interpret the Old Testament law in a new covenant age. So in what ways has Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law, and in what ways does that Old Testament law still have application for Christians today? This is a huge discussion, like way bigger than tattoos, okay? And it has bearing on uh, issues related to homosexuality and others. I will say that uh, the general approach that people take in the new the general approach is, is where Jesus explicitly changes things, uh, that we, we go with we go with him because he's the institutor of the new covenant. Uh, in places where he does not explicitly change things, usually we we stick with what was said unless there is grounds to not. Anyway, that sounds very convoluted, but my point is that Jesus has fulfilled the law. He is the end of the law, Romans 10.4. And so it, it, what then... what kinds of law keeping are we required to do? Because there's certain things that we don't obviously do. We don't offer sacrifices because one sacrifice has been made. Uh, we can we we have freedom to wear different kinds of, we eat different kinds of food, right? Because Peter saw the change, right? So these are the right when the sheet comes down from heaven, he's able to eat the different animals. So there has been shifts and change changes to the Old Testament law. One of the things that people oftentimes immediately jump into when you talk about this is, oh, that's that's right. The that's why we should shouldn't listen to what the Bible has to say in the Old Testament about homosexuality. The problem is, of course, the New Testament reaffirms what the Bible in the Old Testament says about homosexuality, and so you have explicit statements in First Corinthians six and Romans one about the enduring significance of the moral law that's taught regarding homosexuality. But all that to say, what do you do with tattoos then? Is that so, an enduring part of the Old Testament law? So it kind of t- dovetails with what you guys are saying about cultural significance, because it looks like, just doing a quick read of this passage, everything that it's talking about is um, having to do with some sort of spiritualism, like don't turn into mediums or necromancers, um, not make cuts on your body for the dead. Um, so it sounds like the tattoo in that culture has something to do with some kind of extra spiritual... Um, right. 
activity that isn't in line with what God would have his people do. Right. Is so it the today? meaning of the tattoo was that, yeah. Is that what it is today? No. Well, not yeah. for in North America anyways. No. No. So, Greg, what do you think? You got a lot of tattoos, Greg. Yep. Got a lot of ink. Yeah. I think the other part people would say is honoring your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. That would be the New Testament part that people would bring into this debate. So is it honoring your body to have stuff written on it? Um, that text, though, appears in a sexual context. So I'm not overly sure if, if treating that... Uh, I, I, know we, I know we approach you know, overeating and things like that, although I, I would tend to think that that has something more to do with the sin of, sin of gluttony. But I know I know people want to use that text to try to say this is why you should be healthy. This is why you should because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I do I do think again we need to read these passages in their context. So I don't want to over I don't want to overstate that. Hmm. Uh, I do think that clearly the cultural significance of a tattoo has shifted in yeah. the last number of years. Right from as Andy said from being I will never have a tattoo to people being like no, uh, uh, it's okay for me to ha-. I mean. Hmm. You're unusual if you don't have a tattoo today. I don't. Nobody at this table has a tattoo? I do not. A bunch of non-tattooed people talking about tattoos. <laughs> How dare we? The That's thing, great. I, I think the, the, the importance here is what is the significance um, of the tattoo? I, I mean, yeah. clearly there are ways in which you could be getting tattoos that are clearly uh, wrong. Uh, but for the most part, as far as I'm concerned, ink away. I, I also think that there's an element where... Under the category of not wanting to cause other people to stumble, for us to have tattoos in places where it can be easily covered up by by clothing choices so that it's not you're not actually making it an issue for other people. So if you're in some settings where you think, you know what, I don't need my tattoo to be showing, then so this is a Christian freedom issue for you. Totally. And then you and because it's a Christian freedom issue, you think, is it a wise decision to put this so verse you, reference or not? And then how do I use this Christian freedom in a way that's not going to make others how, unnecessarily how would, how would you, stumble. How would you be creating, leading someone into sin? Yeah, maybe that's not the right category well, to put the, it in. Do you understand what I'm saying there? I'm like, I, totally. I just want to explain that for people yeah. who are listening. So first, Greg is saying that he doesn't believe that this particular aspect of the Old Testament law is an enduring aspect. Crystal's pointed out that there are that that there's actually a context to that passage which seems to indicate that the tattoo is not just the tattoo, it's what the tattoo meant. And yeah. associated and with the yeah, with the Canaanite So we're practices. saying that, look, in this day and age, the tattoo does not mean what it meant back when the Canaanite practices were what they were. There are parts of the world where it would mean that. And I would imagine that this text would have that same application, but not not in our cultural context. So we're left then with a the question, okay, what do we do? Are we free to do it? Or are we not free to do it? And Greg has appealed, I think, to uh, this is a Christian freedom issue then. So some people are going to have freedom to do it, and others it's going to be against their conscience, and they shouldn't do it. The, the texts that we're talking about are in First, uh, First Corinthians 8, 9. Am I right about that? The and God? and uh, also in Romans 14 and 15, I want to say. Romans 14. These are the passages that have to do with Christian freedom. And so in those passages, you are called not to use your freedom, uh, certainly as an excuse for sin, but also not to use your freedom as to affront others, or better said, to lead others to sin. Mm. So you need to consider whether or not your activities are actually leading someone into sin. Like So, so an example, right. I might have the freedom to drink alcohol, and Greg might not. Uh, what that's saying is, Greg, don't or Jeff, don't go and invite Greg to the pub, mm. right? Because you're creating a situation where he his conscience is likely going to be offended, mm. right? So I need to consider his freedoms and go to, for lack of a better word, the lowest common denominator when it comes to my friendship, mm. right? doesn't mean I can't go to the pub. It's just that I'm not going to go to the pub with Greg, and I'm not going to lead him into a situation like that. Okay, I might have a freedom to watch a rated R movie. Somebody else might have a less less freedom in that regard, in terms of you know their sensitivity to different things like violence and others. So so I would not take Greg to that movie if he had less of a freedom. So we see how this works. Yeah. So what you're saying, my question then is, in what way is having a tattoo leading someone into sin? And so this is where I would probably 
yeah, I'd be happy to move away from those those categories in terms of me having a tattoo leading people to sin because me having one doesn't mean you're going to now get one if you feel that having one would be uh, an offense to your your views of right and wrong. But, but what I would say is that... You wouldn't pressure somebody no, to, into having it, and you would not consider somebody who has a tattoo to be better... Or worse. Or worse. Right. A- and I'm also saying that there are, there are ways in which we can... I- I'm thinking of myself as someone who is on stages, and... I've, you have everyone has barriers to overcome in order to have a hearing with people. Mm. And if me wearing a longer sleeve shirt to cover up my arm tattoo is going to eliminate one of those barriers of someone hearing me out, I think it's wise to do that. So I think that I would go with, yes, I think it would be wise and, you know, becoming all things to all men type thing right. in order to gain a hearing. However, if people in the room were of the belief that this tattoo on Greg is a signal that he is less a Christian. Hmm. I think you should actually take your shirt off. Roll up the sleeve, baby. And I think you should display it. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because we are into a realm of legalism now, hmm. the likes of which uh, Paul the, he, like he condemns in hmm. Galatians to say that one is made uh, more Christian by something that l- like this or less Christian by something like this. We are made more and less Christian by our relationship to Jesus, which has been settled by him on the cross. So, period. Uh, so we don't raise these other standards. And when we do, it is appropriate to affront them. Okay? I, I, I believe. Hmm. Yeah. So you see Paul doing this where he demands, he actually asks, I think it's Titus to get, was it Titus or Timothy to get circumcised? Timothy, I think. Timothy. But he says, I think, to Titus that he, won't, he doesn't need to. I can't mm-hmm. remember one or the other that, that he, he yep. they don't need to. Yep. But the reason he says they don't need to is because the people who are who are around them are like, you know what, we, we want, you know, you have to be circumcised in order to be a good Christian. And Paul's like, nope, I, I, <laughs> nope, not at all. In fact, I'm going to shout it from the housetops, hey, this guy's not circumcised, he's a Gentile. See what I mean? Mm. Yeah. I had an interesting situation when I preached my very first sermon the pastor, I was in college, pastor <clears throat> met with me and gave me the opportunity to preach, and, but he said, just one thing, Andy, he said, uh, at that time I had uh, hair, and <laughs> I also had earrings, and he said, I, I want you what? to... I know, I know. Nice. I, I couldn't have the, you know, ba- when I lost all the hair, I th- figured I better take the earrings out, because I look too much like Mr. Clean. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, so at any rate, so he said, you know, I want you to take your earrings out if you're going to preach here at the church, because I don't want it to be a distraction from the gospel. To which I was like, you know what, hey, I don't want to be a distraction to the gospel. Earrings, I'll take those out, no problem. But it was interesting, because I also had a shark tooth necklace at the time. Those were cool at that time, I'll have you know. No, no I, they were. I, I they were, were cool. Of the shark tooth necklace. <laughs> I want to yeah. meet this Andy. <clears throat> Who's this? Ha- this hairy, <laughs> earringed, shark tooth <laughs> necklace. And my hair was dyed blonde. But th- those are all beside the point. Oh uh, but the, but with the shark tooth necklace, he wanted me to take that off as well, and and I remember thinking, now now you've gone too far. Really, because yeah, that's gone the earrings far. are one thing, but this <laughs> necklace with a shark's tooth on it, this timeless piece of art. <laughs> oh, it depends on the reason that he's he's asking you to do that, right? Right. I mean, ultimately, he's asking you to do that because he he wants to commend you to the people in his church and not yeah. give them any reason to not listen to what you have to say. Exactly. But my my point, though, pushing back on this, or not pushing back, but just you know. Speaking to this is that there comes a point where, yeah, you want to do the best you can to make sure that the gospel gets the greatest hearing. At the same time, there's a there's a point where you want to be true to yourself. Sure, right. And 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 I think there's a constant balancing act that, that's taking place there. There is, but you know, it, it is the balancing act between being all things to all men, being with mm-hmm. you know that you know I become Jew to the Jews so that I may win the more, as Paul says. Um, but at the same, so there's that contextualizing piece. But there's also, like, this is when Paul when Paul runs up against a place that where his contextualizing is going to be misconstrued as saying that oh yeah, uh, there's the gospel plus this other stuff. He will immediately stop. Uh, he'll clarify and uh, even act out in ways that that show that that extra stuff isn't isn't necessary. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, yeah. 
This is why he confronts Peter about eating with only the Jews. He does that in Galatians. He describes, describes that. He calls him out and so, says, you're being, you're being wrong about this. Now, Peter might have been doing that in order to win a hearing with the Jews. I don't know. But Paul's like, this, you, what you're doing is you're burying the gospel here and, and in the minds of all these other people. So you need to stop it. I think there's a bit of a difference between being like a one-off speaker like you were and someone that's like a long-term at that church. Like I think for Jeff, over years, you can kind of slowly get people's minds open. It's like a frog in the legalism. kettle. I can but you're not going to throw them. You're not going to throw some guy that's there one day no. into a situation and expect them to do the same thing. No. So I think there's different expectations depending mm. no, on... No, most people who are listening are willing to say, oh, this guy's, you know, like, he, so he's got a shark tooth necklace and I think that's awful. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. So I think, are we, are we all them. agreed then if this is in the realm of Christian, uh, Christian freedom? Yes. Right. And, and you, there, there's a contextualizing aspect of it that you want to be sensitive. And yet there's also the, the, uh, the confronting element of it for those, for the legalist, for the legalist. So for this listener, if, if their family tends to be a family full of Christian legalists, you might push him to get the tattoo. I would, I would. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a wisdom piece but, in terms of what you actually get tattooed on. Right, there. right. But <laughs> it right. can be really bad ideas. Yeah, there's a guy in our church actually has a has a uh, Chicago Bulls tattoo on his shoulder because he was so into Michael Jordan, and now it just doesn't it doesn't quite hold the same importance. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Asked him, are you are you a Bulls fan? Eh, no, not really. not really anymore. That's hey, awesome. well, I, when I was 18, I wanted to get a tattoo of a dragon on my chest. And I'm very thankful that, that that I did not get that tattoo. <laughs> there should be a, maybe a ban on age, like a certain age yeah. limit that you have to be to get a tattoo. You have to think for a certain yeah. m- length of time yeah. about the tattoo before you get it. Right. All right, one more question here. Uh, this is a, a few episodes ago we, we talked about uh, divorce. And um, so this person had a follow-up question about Divorce, and the question is, can a person who has been through a divorce actively seek out a new relationship through dating, or is the divorcee left with chastity? Well, I'm going to say uh, it depends. And uh, so I'm going to point you to 1 Corinthians 7 here. And I think 1 Corinthians 7 is probably the best text to start with when you think about the doctor, when you think about the Bible's teaching on divorce. Some people would say, no, 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 Jesus has stuff to say about it. And he does, absolutely. Matthew 19, Matthew 5, I mean, he has stuff to say regarding divorce and remarriage. However, Paul in this text actually summarizes the teaching of Jesus, and he adds his own apostolic two cents to the matter. And he actually addresses different parties which I think is really helpful. So mm-hmm. if you want to know what the Bible teaches in the New Covenant era regarding divorce and remarriage, 1 Corinthians 7 is probably your best bet. So I'll read verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 7. To the unmarried and widows... Okay, so now listen when he says unmarried and widows. Don't read there. Uh, oh, that's people who've been divorced, because he's going to address people actually later in that way. But to unmarried and widows, so people who, who are, who've been single their whole life and who have lost their spouse through death. I say that it's good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. I've heard these words actually applied to people who are in a divorce situation. That's not the intent of the author here. He's addressing two particular kinds of people, single for a long time and those who are widows, right? So he sees them as legitimately getting remarried, but he wants to commend the single life to them. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's my advice to you. Stay single. So can I ask a question here? Yep. Uh, I've heard some talk about that phrase unmarried or the word unmarried referring to, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but referring to Paul seeing him, or this is kind of evidence for Paul being a widower himself. And so for people who so the category of kind of if you're a widow or a widower, the encouragement is, at, if at all possible, to remain single as he is now. Yeah, in the first century, there was a, there was a real, uh, even in Roman society, there was a, it was a highly honored activity for a widow or a widower 
to remain faith faithful. Even they even use that language to their spouse. Hmm. It wasn't required by Paul clearly here, but it was highly valued. Now that again, please don't hear me as saying that hey, that's the way hmm. it should be today. But I think that's what's behind what he's saying. That he's saying, look, it's a good thing for you to remain single. Right. But if you burn, as, as the passage says, what if you burn with passion, or if you cannot exercise self control, you should marry. For it's better to marry than burn with passion. Right. Okay, so then he addresses the next group in verse 10. To the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord, he says in parentheses, meaning that hey, I'm just, I'm just going to paraphrase the teaching of Jesus here. Okay? The wife should not separate from her husband, and separate there would mean divorce. Okay? Uh, I know that we have different categories for separation and divorce these days because of legal proceedings. That's not what it's meant here. It's meant that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried. So in other words, if she does, if she is divorced or separated in the language of this text, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to the husband. So there's two options for her, and they are? I'm just Remain asking unmarried. you guys. Yeah, there's one. Or be reconciled. Or be reconciled. Okay. Now he is he is not applying the first, you know, verses eight and nine to this person. <laughs> he's not talking about that person. He's, he's saying, look, there's two options you've got: remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to your husband. The husband should not divorce his wife. And the reason I think that that separate means divorce is because it's used as a synonym for that word right there. Okay. Mm-hmm. To the rest, I say. So sorry, one more question. Yeah. That line where it says, and should, and the husband should not divorce his wife, that the application is the same? It's just, yep. husband saying, yeah, same, same for the husband. Yeah, this is actually quite a remarkable thing that Paul's done here. Mm-hmm. He's actually said, oh, let me apply this to women, which would have been the, the expected cultural approach, and then he takes the same teaching and he applies it to the men. In fact, he does the same thing in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, talking about sexual faithfulness and and sexual actual involvement between a husband and a wife, and he says, "Look, the wife shouldn't pull herself away from her husband, and neither should the husband his wife." So, like, it's it's equal hmm. in his application for for both, which is quote, mm-hmm. quite shocking hmm. in this day. Um, anyway, so you have your first two categories: the to the unmarried and widows in verse eight, and then to the married, I give this charge, and then to the rest, I say, <laughs> I not the Lord. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, okay, so so what? Who are the rest? This is the cha- this is the challenge. So you've got categories here: the un- unmarried and widows. So these are people who are not involved in marriage, mm-hmm. okay. Although they might be thinking about it, he's like, no, don't you don't need to worry about it. But if you if you have to, go for it. And then there's the the married, and I I'm assuming he's speaking there of the Christian married couple. And the reason I'm saying that is because he says to the rest, and then it applies it to a mixed married couple, meaning a Christian and a non-Christian, being so in a marriage. So people who have come to faith later right. through his later, ministry? Yep. Maybe the husband or just the wife. Right. It's only yeah. one of them is a Christian now. So, but, so verses 10 and 11, to the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. He's saying that the wife should not separate from her husband. She's talking about two Christians. So here are two Christians who are married and they separate or divorce, which is the same same thing for him. So uh, they only have two options. So if you're Christian and you get divorced, you can be reconciled or you can remain unmarried. But there's the rest, and the rest are not Christian-Christian marriages, but in this case, Christian, non-Christian marriage. To the rest I say, verse 12, I not the Lord. So he's, probably, he's, he's not saying, well, this has less authority. He's just saying this isn't something Jesus has had talked about, but this is the very circumstance that you guys are in, many of you, so mm-hmm. let me address it using apostolic authority this, that was given me by Jesus, okay? To the rest I say, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Okay, so don't seek divorce because you're, you're, you're mixed marriage. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Again, you see the equality between these two, right? 
For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. It's not saying they're saved, but it means that they have a special... The word holy means to be set apart. There's a set special kind of ministry that is happening in the life of that person because of their... their one of them is married. Hmm. Or, sorry, one of them is Christian. Christian. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if anyone has a husband who is an unbeliever, verse 12... Or 13, and consents to live with her, he should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. You can debate what that means, again, but there is a there is a set-apart sense in which uh, your involvement as a Christian spouse in a, in a mixed marriage actually does something for your kids in setting them apart when it comes to faith stuff, okay? But we can debate about that later. Verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, okay, which is means divorce, let it be so. Actually, I think the Greek there is that you are not bound. Mm-hmm. So in other words, if they want to go, don't hold them back. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Now, the brother or sister means that the Christian party is not bound to that marriage, meaning that they have freedom to remarry. God has called you to peace. So you don't have to fight with them over this. Or how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? I actually think this passage really gives you a really nice treatment of this subject, personally. Mm-hmm. So, summarizing, uh, the, the married Christian couple who get divorced, right, uh, have two options, uh, re- uh, not remarried, but um, be reconciled or uh, stay single. And then if you're, if you're a, a mixed marriage between a, a Christian and a non-Christian, you have an option uh, to remarry. You're not bound. What complicates either this a little can, bit... Either you can remain together or... Yes, you can, absolutely. You can but if you get remarry. divorced, yeah, you can, you're not bound. Uh, what complicates is... What complicates this issue uh, are two, a couple things. No, number one, Jesus gives a con, a, an exception clause t- for marital unfaithfulness, or the word Greek word porneia, mm-hmm. saying to this. So clearly, he also adds to this. Although it's interesting how Paul, when he refra- when he summarizes the teaching of Jesus, doesn't include that. But in Matthew, you have these exception clauses saying that if, well, but except for porneia, and in that case, we would say no, you have freedom to divorce and and re and remarry. We can debate what constitutes porneia, uh, but usually adultery or things like it. Uh, and second, the thing that complicates this is uh, some people claim to be Christians mm-hmm. and are not. So what happens when you have a, a married couple, they've been coming to church, right? the wife leaves the husband, refuses to be reconciled, where does that leave the husband? Is he now unable? So say it again, a married couple comes married to church. Married couple, yeah. Both and Christians? See, the challenge... Both, yeah, that's both the question. claiming to be Christians. As, yeah, both claim. That's, that's the As question. As pastors, our first priority in this is to try to figure out what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Are we dealing with a truly Christian couple? Are we dealing with two unbelievers? Or are we dealing with a mixed relationship? Right. And you, you might be hearing that going, well, how can you make the determination? Well, actually, church discipline is the way you make the determination. That's what church discipline ultimately does, is if somebody is actually living in an unrepentant sin against the Lord, I mean, like, they know it's wrong, but they're choosing to do it. Say, for example, hey, I want to go and cheat on you with this other woman, and I want to keep doing it, or whatever. Maybe not that. Maybe I'm uh, filthy greedy, and I don't want to repent. What do we say about that person? Like, I know that, what do we say? Are they Christian or are they not? Well, yeah, their lives aren't Right, so we're going to carry them saying. through a process mm-hmm. to try to warn them, and then we're going to have to make a judgment about them regarding their marriage, whether or not they should maintain uh, that marriage relationship, or sorry, whether or not they have, uh, whether or not they're, what category they fall in when it comes to 1 Corinthians 7, because it might be a mixed marriage. And that's not a determination, by the way, that you can make while you're sitting there looking at your spouse. I don't think they're a Christian, whatever. I mean, because everybody's everyone sins. The question that's a determination for the church to make. And actually, quite honestly, we have we have that authority. Matthew 18 says that the church actually has that authority 
what is what what is bound in you know on earth will be bound in heaven. So I, this is where the church comes in, and we end up trying to figure out our first port of call is try to figure out what category are we dealing with here. Is it a is it a Christian Christian marriage or Christian non Christian marriage? If it's a Christian Christian marriage, then we know there's two options, okay, except for marital unfaithfulness. And if it's a Christian non Christian marriage, we know that 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 the unbelieving spouse, if they decide to go, the the believing spouse is not bound. Okay? So we're always trying to put those into those categories because I think actually they're quite um, comprehensive, to be honest. It's how you get and understand people to be in those categories. That was long, and but I hope it was at least somewhat helpful to try to answer the question. So so I don't know what situation you're dealing with. So when, when we say, when people come to our church and they ask questions about marriage and divorce, oftentimes we want to say, you know, it, it depends on what situation you're in, because clearly it does depend for Paul mm-hmm. what situation you're in. And so we're going to try to say remarriage is allowed when divorce is legally allowed or rightfully allowed. And I want to say legally, I don't remember the state of the state or the, yeah, but biblically allowed, remarriage is allowed. I think it's important to just mention that we take it, we take the, we take marriage seriously here at Northview and that we, it, it's, I think it's far too easy in a lot of contexts where it's just these easy outs out of, out of marriage. And what you see in the Bible is that's just not the case. It's a commitment that God wants to hold you to. And there are only certain you know, mm. exceptions to, that you can get out of that agreement that you made. Mm. For and each if people other and have this God. in their mind that if they go through this divorce, they're um, kind of submitting themselves to lifetime singleness. Mm. Like, would that change their mind about what they're going through? Like, would they actually want then to um, be reconciled? Mm. Yeah, maybe or really I want to make a relationship? it work. <laughs> if, because, if this is what if, if I'm making this decision, because the, the church I don't think has been we've softened on that in terms of you mean you know, the church like universal or the church. Or Northview in particular. Well, I'm saying in the past, maybe I think Northview's gotten a little bit more kind of biblically faithful with this. I'm not sure how it's been in the past, but mm. I think in general, the church in general has softened on divorce, right? And we're happy yeah. for people to be remarried and to be in good relationships. I have never and met somebody who didn't believe as any. I've never met a Christian who didn't believe that their divorce was a, a biblically sound one. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, quite surprising because I've met a lots and lots of divorced people. So yeah, I also think that it's partly the fault of the church, though. We haven't actually taught this text very well. Actually, like even just reading through it and saying, well, here's what the Bible says about it. We make divorce and remarriage sound like it's like the Bible is so unclear regarding mm. what it says. And when actually, actually, Paul's pretty clear regarding the categories that are there. And we actually have some processes that Paul gives, that the Bible gives us in several places to try to determine what kinds of people we're dealing with in these situations. Mm. So employing that those is actually part of the yeah. part of the gig, and we also have a team of pastors and elders who uh, are equipped to <clears throat> help you kind of discern where your situation is at and how to help you best move forward. So you should contact. Let me start earlier on though by saying uh, <laughs> my big fear is that divorce doesn't have, or I, I believe divorce doesn't have to happen. Hmm. It doesn't. The problem is that we're all pretty prideful people, and so when things are going a little bit sideways in our marriages, we instead of seeking help, we decide we tend to internalize it and solve the problems. If people came to the church and sought help earlier, mm-hmm. we would be not dealing with, hey, what kind of circumstances do we have regarding whether divorce is allowed? We would have two very happy Christ- Christian, you know, married people. Mm. Uh, because they've been able to work out some of their kinks when it comes to communication or expectations or all that sort of stuff. But for for whatever reason in our culture, you're not allowed to have any problems or at least say that you do. Hmm. You know, you got to put up your Facebook profile and your life needs to kind of look look that clean and, and, and good. When the truth is, it's not clean and good. Everyone's marriage at some point struggles. Everyone's. So just own it. Seek some help. From people who can help before it goes to d- goes to places that it doesn't need to go. Yeah, Vic and Thalia would love to have people come in when the cracks start happening, not when they're already the right. Grand Canyon. Hmm. All right, thank you guys so much for your contributions. If you have questions you want to send in to the extra podcast, send them to extra at northview.org. Can you finish this podcast by uh, by being like how a Wookiee would? Sure. Like, how could how would Chewbacca finish this podcast, Greg? He would say very clearly, 
Okay, that was different than before. <laughs> no, it's the same. No, no it gets worse every time, <laughs> actually. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys remember Police Academy, Bobcat, Gold? That's exactly what that sounds like. Have a good week. <laughs> 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 <laughs>